Hona Big in the Ag Budget Office. I um, receive your proposals that <coughs> come come from the department that have department approval, <coughs> and I look at them, uh, review the budget and any other forms that may come along. And one of the things that I found that is probably the biggest thing a lot of times is the budget narrative. It takes a lot of time to do it. It's detailed work. It's it's probably one of the least favorite parts of doing a grant proposal. So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to give you a couple examples of budget narratives that have come from actual proposals. From two people in this room, they'll remain, remain nameless, but one of them you can probably tell by looking at what they're requesting, and you can probably figure out who it is. But It's not a secret or anything, but um, I just thought it would be helpful to use actual information that I've gotten from actual proposals. Okay, I have written this uh, budget narrative based on what you would be using with the USDA AFRI proposal. A lot of you write those, and even though this is for an AFRI proposal, that's not to say that you couldn't use this for other grant projects as well. The underlying principle is still the same. The purpose of the budget narrative is to explain or describe what can't be explained by looking at the budget form itself. It's, it's just a further explanation of what you're doing, um, what you're buying, giving just a little more detail. And you want your budget narrative to be clear, you want it to be easy to read. It should be a narrative form. You shouldn't have spreadsheets and that kind of thing attached. I know sometimes it, it's, depending on the sponsor guidelines, it's easier to put things in table <coughs> form and that, that's fine. Um, there's a lot of different rules and as you've heard many times today, follow the instructions. I can tell you this is how it is for, you know, how we might like to see it for NIFA. That doesn't mean that that's appropriate for everyone. I know NRCS is very strict and very detailed about what they require for budget narratives. They want things broken up by year. They want everything very detailed. But just for today's illustration, I chose the USDA um, budget form and have, uh, have laid it out similar to, to that form. So, oh, one other thing that I wanted to mention before we get started is make sure that you, your budget narrative is formatted like your project narrative. Make sure you pay attention to margins, font size, spacing, all of that. Um, you, again, you want it to be easy to read. This is probably going to be one of the last things that reviewers read. And so you want it to be easy. They can click down the list, look at the costs, and, and, and get a good idea for it. So make sure that you pay attention to the formatting requirements of the, of the sponsoring agency. So we'll start out with salaries. Um, for this proposal, there aren't any, there's no PI salary or uh, co-PI salary. There's graduate students. It states briefly what it is they'll be doing. Uh, same with the undergraduate students, um, indicating what they're, they're doing. I've indicated the hourly rate because I know USDA has come back and asked us for that from time to time. I would avoid including a lot of calculations like 20 hours at $10 an hour equals X amount because it's too cumbersome <coughs> to make sure, well, first of all, that they're absolutely correct. And then too, if you have to go back and change something, then you have to remember to change it here and change it there. And it gets, I, I would really just avoid that. Um, and with the budget form with grants.gov, for salaries, it's already indicated on the form how much time is being spent on the project. So there's no need to duplicate that in the budget narrative. So keep it kind of clean and keep it clear and, and succinct. Um, I've included money for a research technician, indicating that a 3% salary increase is included in each <coughs> And just a short paragraph on fringe benefits and how they're computed. 
There again, there's no need to itemize those specifically because they are included, they are itemized in the budget form itself. Equipment, there again, uh, this is one sentence. I suppose we could have had maybe a bit more on this, but uh, I think that it's, it's fine the way it is. Travel, travel needs <coughs> to be kind of ugly, uh, just because there's a lot of different costs being included in travel. I like to just include the basis for your cost. For instance, I put motor pool at 34 cents per mile, meals $30 a day, and lodging $70 a night. That indicates that those are the base. That's the basis for your for your costs. And there again, there's no need to break it down by year because that's broken down by year on the budget form. Attend national professional meeting. That's that's pretty much a standard inclusion for all grants.gov budgets. Um, there again, I think it's just make it real simple. Attend one to two regional meetings. Uh, just indicate how much it is per trip. A lot of times, for USDA grants, they will say you are required to attend a PI meeting. Please. Include please budget funds for this. I'd like to have that separated. That way they know that you have specifically budgeted to attend that meeting. And and just give a total for the travel. So, Ona, you don't want plane tickets broken down in mileage. I mean, you don't want all of that for those national meetings. You just want one light item that says this is what the trip's going to cost. Right. I like it broken down to say the airfare will cost, you know, $600, meals, so much. But it okay. the, you don't need to say three days, three nights, unless they specifically say to do that, and sometimes sometimes with different programs within USDA, they will. So there again, it all gets back to following the instructions. Materials and supplies, I like to have people group like supplies together, as you can, as you can see here. Um, <coughs> Rather than having one big long paragraph where everything is just just listed, um, this is a project that involves quite a diverse uh, set of supplies. Um, everything from manure sampling to agronomy supplies to lab supplies. Um, but I think that it's sufficient to group like supplies together and give a total for each. Publications. For this one, there wasn't any, oh, there is for extension materials. Um, as I said, it's fine to include publication costs for um, publishing your results of your work or your research or your extension work. Um, the results of the project, that's what belongs technically in this category. Printing most appropriately belongs on a blank line in the other direct cost category, you would say printing of workshop materials or something like that. If it turns out that you need that line for something else, it's fine to put the printing for the workshop materials with the publications. Ona, would you ever have them put printing or something like that in instructional supplies and put it up with materials and supplies? <coughs> Are you talking about not like if they're printing for a workshop or whatever? Would you put that in instructional supplies and then put it up in the materials and supplies and just a just a lineup in in that um, justification in the narrative? That would be when they're using the like the NDSU budget form because yeah, the, the grants.gov form doesn't have a specific line for instructional material and supplies, it's just materials and supplies. Yeah, but, but would you think that that could be in materials and supplies or not really? No. It's other, it's considered other direct. It's other or it's publications. I would say it fits more closely with publications than it does with materials and supplies. I always think of materials and supplies as a consumable, something that you, tangible that you buy and you use up, that you basically, I don't want to say consume, but that it's a material thing that you're purchasing. Okay, now to the <laughs> other direct costs or fees, which is probably my very least favorite thing to deal with because it's, it, that's where everything else that doesn't have a category falls into. So 
Um, these are typically itemized because that's what USDA has always wanted us to do. And so you can see there's a fair amount of detail um, for the different types of supplies. And there again, I've tried to group somewhat similar uh, fees together. I know that soil samples are a lot different probably than manure samples, but they're all samples that are sent away to a lab to have some analysis done and give results back. The fees that are showing up under other fees are completely different than the others. Carcass grading and trucking fees don't fit at all with the other ones, and so that's why that's why they're separated <coughs> here. And for the grant stat valve budget form, and I wish I had a bigger monitor, I could have the form up with the budget narrative, but it just it's not enough room. Um, you would have, you, you should ideally have these on two separate lines and you could just label it as lab analysis fees on the blank line and then below that you could have other fees. And then of course it's explained in the budget narrative what the other fees are. And indirect costs, um, normally you don't need to include an explanation of indirect costs if you're using the rate that is specified by USDA because they're already telling you that's what you should use. And so I wouldn't even recommend addressing that because sometimes people will put in language that isn't correct. They'll say this is NDSU's rate when in fact it's not NDSU's rate, it's USDA's rate. So if you're using the USDA rate, just you don't need to address it. And they say that in their guidelines too, that that's not something that you need to address. For this project, <coughs> I have, it, it turned out, um, I indicated that it would be using NDSU's federally approved rate on modified total direct costs. Now, when I think about it, I'm not sure that that's exactly the right calculation, but I wanted to put that language in there so that you could see how that verbiage, um, how, you should, how you should word that. Any questions so far? using the rate that is specified by USDA. You can, I mean, I'm not saying you, you, that you shouldn't, it's just that you don't need to because they have already specified this is the rate you will use. So unless you're using something different, there's no need to explain it. of another budget narrative that is perhaps more typical of an extension project. Um, there's PI salary. There, there again, just a short explanation of what the person is doing. A 3% salary increase has been budgeted each year. Uh, support for graduate students. There again, there's no, I haven't, in, I haven't included a number here because the number is, the number of graduate students is already set in the budget form. There's no need to, to duplicate that. And as long as we're talking about salary, make sure that the amount of effort that you show on your budget form is, now let me reword this, the amount of effort that you show on your current and pending support form needs to be greater than or equal to the amount that's on the budget form. You don't want your current and pending support form to show less effort than what you're requesting salary for that'd be a big problem. Um, so that's just something to remember. Um, graduate students, undergrad students, I know sometimes people have trouble converting people who are paid on an hourly basis to funded work months because you're thinking of someone on an hour, you know, part-time hourly basis. Well, how does that transfer to months, which is what you have to insert on the grants.gov budget form? I've included a little calculation there to show that to you. 
I'm not going to go through it now because I know Marie's got to get on board here with her. She's got some good spreadsheets for everybody to use. Um, there again, equipment. Equipment <coughs> is explained. Uh, PD well, travel. Can I ask another question? Can you go back up to how you calculate the months because we can't see it back here? So how did you decide to calculate the months for the students? Uh, just, there were five students. They were 10 hours per week. Uh, that's 50 hours a week, 50 times 52 weeks, and I know they're not really working 52 hours a week, but just for the ease of computation, I use 52 hours. That's 2,500 hours. Well, there's 2,080 working hours in a year, so just divided that, comes up to 1.21 years, which is the equivalent of 14.4 months. Say on and in the issue, graduate students get their side or their uh, their tuition pay. A lot of universities they don't. So you don't think it's necessary to say how much per graduate student? I mean, for their stipend or for yeah, tuition? for what are, you, are you're paying their what are you paying? Get an hourly wage. Or? Graduate student stipends I think are a year, isn't it a yearly amount? So like some universities, you might have to pay a graduate student $50,000 because they have to pay for their tuition too. Do you not think that's necessary to explain it? Any issue we don't have to do it? I don't know. We've never done it. That's not to say. I, re I reviewed a lot of grants where they asked for a fortune for a graduate student because they have to pay a lot of tuition. If we, and we can, we haven't, we, just started including tuition on grants now, and so if someone wants to include it in a USDA NIFA grant, they can certainly do that. And I believe the appropriate place <coughs> to do that is under other direct costs. There's a blank line. Um, you would just type in graduate student tuition. Just be sure to identify it and identify the justification so I can find it because you don't collect any direct costs. <coughs> <clears throat> and also make sure that the tuition is an allowable expense um, because there are some sponsors that don't pay it. Um, I think that I understood your question correctly as well. Um, we, from sponsor programs, has, have discouraged putting in that tuition waiver language into the budget narrative okay. because what that does is, is that even though we know that the, you know, the institution is paying that tuition cost, if you write it into the budget narrative, then it becomes a required cost share, which is trackable. Oh, okay. So if you know, if you find that, you know, for a particular program that you have to somehow, you know, identify it, then we ask for a very generic language that would not be dollar value specific. So then, as an institution, we are not required to track it. And that was another thing I was going to mention is, if matching funds are not required, keep the language in your budget narrative, um, refer, make sure that you're only referring to the cost that you are requesting, nothing else. Because as Amy said, if you even just mention the PI is not collecting salary but will spend 10% of his time on the project, that's cost share. So by trying to explain something, you have just obligated yourself to 10% of that person's time being spent on the project and documented. That's that's not something that we want to voluntarily do. Um, here again, there's travel. I've indicated 36 cents per mile, the amount. Um, national meetings for both the project, well, project director, project director is depending on. Um, one year, one director may go, another year, both of them may go. Again, I've inserted language about attending an AFRI project director's meeting, um, travel for student teachers. Okay, other direct costs. These are these costs are a little bit different than the costs in the other budget narrative. Um, I've gone into more detail here because it's if I would have just put in forty forty two thousand three hundred dollars for supply kits, you would have no idea what it is. So I've detailed a little bit. Um, paper products, folders, markers, beads for 225 children and participating in the during school program and 360 children in the after school 4-H program.
here again, classroom materials are kind of self-explanatory. <coughs> this would be used to evaluate physical activity levels. Um, backpacks and metal boards for participating <coughs> students. Project resource materials will be purchased and inserted into binders. Um, you know, we, we, when it comes to supplies, that I've, I've, some of them that I've seen in the past, there's just been too much detail in what you're buying. They'll say, I need 50 binders at $3.50 each, and I'll need, um, oh, I can't even think of it now, but all kinds of, you know, different items that are very itemized, and you really want to stay away from that. Publications, I've included an extension bulletin um, being produced in years three and four, two journal articles expected in years three and four, a sub-award, Detail how much it is each year. You just give the bottom line for the sub award. It's not necessary to indicate that there's a difference between direct or indirect costs for your sub award. It's the bottom line that that <coughs> institution is receiving. And here again with the other costs, professional services, graphic designer fees, how, much, how many hours, so much per hour, so much per year and the total. Conference calls, um, cost of one conference call with eight partners each month uh, will be $48 a month, $576 a year. Advisory board travel costs. Now this is one area where people get hung up and I can certainly understand why. Um, at NDSU, non-employee travel is not paid as a travel cost, it's paid as a fee. And so the logical thing would be to put it under travel, and I honestly think that's where you know it should go, but our account codes aren't set up like that. So it has to go, it should go, most appropriately go under other things. <coughs> that's how the expense gets paid. Um, there again, I've explained that we're using NDSU's federally approved rate of 38.1% of modified total direct costs. So, Ona, you said non-employee travel should go under the other department. Mm -hmm. And if that comes up in the grant later and we need to change that, then that needs to go like a budget provision? When you say change it, why would well, you? Well, like all of a sudden they decided that they do need to pay some of their non-employee travel for a speaker to come in or something like that. So and you're saying you would be budgeting from travel for NDSU right, employees to, to non-NDSU employee yes. travel? Well, there again, it depends on the funding agency and how strict they are with moving money between categories. If it was a USDA NIFA grant, you would not need to do that. But, you know, there again, if you're unsure, I would contact the grants office, whoever in the grants office is handling your grant, explain the situation to them, ask them if, you know, you need to get sponsor approval. Okay. And if we have sponsor approval, then there isn't too much on the NDSU end other than talking to our grants person. Well, if you have, if you need to make a budget, if they determine that you do have to have sponsor approval, you need to run that request through sponsor programs. Just send an email to Amy or Marie or anyone, um, explain your situation, and they'll take care of it. Sometimes we have had funders who will give us an email message that says, for this particular grant, you have permission to move those line items as needed. And that's a one-time email that we've got on file and attach, and we make changes, and we don't have to continually do that for every change. So depending upon who you're working with, that's really nice if they'll do that. <clears throat> well, I think uh, we'll wrap it up. Marie's got some great uh, <coughs> budget uh, worksheets for everyone. Um, I think she's going to demonstrate those next. Ona, can you share those budget narratives? Or? Sure. I think that might be helpful. That was the other thing. All of the people on that side of the uh, room did not see them. Oh, although we drank that hands on the table, sure.
and we can try to incorporate some of that in. I've tried to follow um, people's thought. When you get a budget, when you're awarded a, an award, they kind of have certain categories, and that's what I've tried to follow in naming the categories here. Then let's say you've got a subcontract of, uh, say, 10000 the first year. And I didn't put matching in on that because you're more than likely not going to use a subcontract as a match. Um, then say 5000 the next year. This will calculate your indirects on that until it reaches 25 k because we only collect on the first 25 k of each subcontract. So those formulas are in there. So for instance, this one you've already collected 25 and if I clicked another 10000 for the second year of funding, that won't um, change your indirect costs right down here. Yes? Is the institution that we're working with a, with the sum contract already calculates their indirect? This is over and above? Yes, or? this is NDSU's indirect cost rate. We collect on the first 25000 of any subcontract. And that covers the administrative part of managing the subcontract. It's, it's in our indirect cost rate. That's why we only collect on the first 25000 of any subcontract. We don't collect beyond that. Um, the figure that this 10000 right here, that would already include the indirects that the person that you're giving the subcontract to, that would include their subcontracts already in that figure. Yes? Uh, in engineering, we have uh, fabrications. So where it will go in this? Uh, fabrications on on ours, it would it would depend if it's going to be a capitalized one or if it's some or a small fabrication because we designed new things. So if you're just designing something that's not meant to be a piece of capitalized equipment. One time okay. use. Then you would put most of your costs would come under the uh, materials. If you're building like a uh, Pro prototype. Or yes. Yeah. Um, then uh, we have rents and leases, we have expendable equipment, which is equipment that costs less than $5,000. Um, it's sort of like materials, you're, you're going to use it up, it doesn't have a long life. And we have operating fees, which I would think of as like, if you're using tools to calibrate something and you have to pay a lab on campus or you have to send it off, that would be a fee. Um, I think you're using agricultural fees, like testing fees. Uh, then professional fees would be, examples of that would be if you're doing a, instead of a subcontract, let's say you've got a consultant that you're hiring. That would go under your professional fees and services. It'd be more of a consultant or a vendor rather than um, a subcontract where they have some a subcontract, they have to have some part of the research responsibility for the research. It's not just they're, they're just doing the testing or something for you. That wouldn't be a subcontract. And then your other expenses would be like on a hat where it's anything else that doesn't fit. <laughs> um, okay, so you've got your total operating expenses calculated here for this particular year. And then there's different ways that you would could be asked to calculate your indirect costs. If, for example, if we're using <coughs> our regular negotiated rate, indirect cost rate that NDSU has, then you would choose this uh, one right here that says FNA using NDSU's negotiated rate schedule. And then that, then you come down here and whatever the rate, like if it's off campus, you could change this to 38.1. and it will recalculate your indirects. If you're using something other than NDSU's negotiated rate, you would click on this second one. For example, uh, foundation A only pays 10% in direct costs. So then you could change this percentage to 10, and you would want to click the second line here that says not using our negotiated rate, and that will recalculate your indirects then. And if you're using something less than our negotiated indirect cost rates, it's, it's going to collect on everything, not just 
what's allowable with our negotiated rate. Like, it could collect on 100% of your subcontract. You would be collecting on tuition. And we have to use whichever would be the least, either the on total costs or on our negotiated rate, whichever rate is going to work out to be the lesser of the two. Depending on, I mean, if your agency allows 10%, and say you have a lot of subcontracts in there, it could come out to be costing more than using our negotiated rate, then we would have to use our negotiated rate instead. Um, if you're using for USDA grants, and say they will only allow 30% based on the total cost, which is your direct costs and your indirects together, uh, put that 30% down here and then click on this total, it's based on the uh, Total requested, and then that will calculate your indirects for you already. Um, then, if you instead of giving us this, this is a five-year budget, and if you wanted to uh, then have it more summarized, I've got it so that it will feed in this third sheet here. It calculates, brings all of those over, and shows you in summary form then what is your requested fund, your matching fund, and your total project. And I also did, back on this second sheet here, because a lot of times we <coughs> would be using a rate, probably don't have a good example here now, but uh, we're not using our negotiated rate, and you do have to show match for this project. One of the things you could show is your unrecovered indirect costs as match if the agency allows it. So I've done a calculation, just in case you need to, to use that, I've calculated what your unrecovered indirect cost rates would be. Um, don't have to use that, it's just there for your use. If you need to use it as matching, it's calculated for you. And what that is, is it's the difference between our negotiated rate and what the agency allows. That's all that calculation. So then here's the summary match again. And we also have other budget sheets out here, but I don't think I'm going to have time to go even into any of those. Are there questions? This was really, really fast, so. Uh, right after, we find out if there's anything else people would like to see on, included in the budget. You have printing, so would we assume publications go up? Well, on our form, yes, and that was one of the things that I've heard as you were talking up here that that seems to be a confusing point. So if there are other categories that would be helpful to you, let me know and we can add those here. On your renting and leases, does that include land leasing, renting, tractors, hotel if rent, rooms? If you're renting, everything. I don't know why you would be renting a hotel room. That's for extension houses, hotel conference rooms. Oh, oh, sure, like a room like this. So if there are other categories that you need or you'd like to see that would be helpful, send us an email and we can add them before we post this for you. Um, and I know this was really, really fast. I'm sorry about that. But and there are other calculating tools on their website, so that you should take some time to. We have a simple one-year budget, and then we have another one similar to this that doesn't have matching. And then this one, I just put the match in. But the big thing with this one is, remember, start with your salary first, and then go to the, because they keep feeding all the way across for you. Okay, I'm going to let Amy talk quickly here.